people. It's so good to be here. So how many of you are community managers? Raise your hand. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Yeah. How many of you are corporate innovators? Yeah, we got our people here. Well, I'm speaking to all of you. And how many of you are product builders and creators? You build things. Yes, I'm talking about today the intersection of what all of you do. And what I'm going to do is show you how to take your community manager superpowers and do special, extra special things that will make you the best partner ever to the people that are building innovative products that you're working with. So if you are building community, if you're building an anything innovative, a product, a service, a game, and you're working together, this is for you. So I'm going to start with a story. What if you had an always-on AI companion that you could talk to anytime? What would that be like? Well, this company went and built it. There are a bunch of Russian computer scientists and journalists with a hot idea. They got big funding. And they had great PR, and they built this really cool AI chatbot, millions of downloads. They created a fast-growing community. You may have seen it on Facebook. It even had spin-offs for very specific subgroups. You're familiar with that, right? But the whole ecosystem, starting with the app, had low engagement. And most importantly, it had a lack of clarity about what the purpose was, which is part of where the low engagement came from. It had what I call an opaque mental model. I bet you've seen things like this. It could seem, what is this thing? It could be so many things. And Replica, the app, played this up. So some people thought, oh, this is like a, a sensitive best friend that it, you know, I could talk to who is even more sensitive than me. Or maybe this is like a friend to go on risk-taking adventures with. That's what it is. Or maybe it's almost like a spiritual guide that will help me really get my way through life. Or maybe some people thought it maybe was like a sex robot because it was so opaque, and so there was a lot of different ways they played with this very advanced piece of AI technology. I love this quote, because it's so true. So they had this big plan, they raised money on the plan, the launch went great, and then they didn't know how to solve their engagement problem. So they tried some stuff. What's the first thing everybody wants to try? Throw some points and badges in there, yay! So they tried that. You, if you know me, you know what a fan I am of that. And guess what happened? Do you think it solved their problem? No. It did give them a lift in their stats. But that lift was short-lived. And it caused a lot of confusion because people are like, OK, I'm earning all this, but where am I headed? They didn't understand. It didn't help them clarify their mental model, right? So then we started working together, and they used game thinking, which is what I'm going to show you today. It's a five-step process. We started by getting our strategy really clear and finding our hot core super fans, that narrow slice of our audience that really didn't just like what we were building but needed it. We clarified our mental model. That was really painful. They wanted it to be opaque, but this was the clarification. After a lot of discussion, a lot of painful soul searching. And then we took that clarified mental model and this newfound understanding of our audience and designed a journey for members to go through. And that was when everything turned around and started to work in terms of retention. So my background is game design. I'm now a startup and innovation coach, and I've been an entrepreneur. I'm also a longtime community architect. I wrote a book called Community Building on the Web, way back in 1999, when dinosaurs roamed the web. And, um, my latest book is Game Thinking, which is really how to implement a strong member journey or customer journey into your product. And I help game studios, global brands, and startups build deep engagement from the ground up. I've worked on dozens and dozens and dozens of projects in my career, and I've been able to work on this string of breakthrough innovative hits from the ground up. When when they were just getting started. eBay, 
Ultima Online. Anybody remember Ultima Online? Oh, yeah. Oh, gee. Rock Band. Anybody know Rock Band? The Sims. Woo! The Sims. Biggest selling PC franchise of all time. Covet Fashion. Breakthrough hit mobile fashion game. Widely copied. Happify, digital mental health app. Each of these massive breakthrough hits created a new category. And every one of them leveraged a super fan community. Not just any community, but a very curated super fan community. And I'm going to show you how to do that today. Does that sound interesting? All right, let's do it. So how do you do it? Use game thinking. Game thinking it embraces and extends agile design thinking, game design, system design, community design. It embraces all of those, but gives you a step-by-step -step process to follow to build the right thing for the right people. The first step is hypothesize. Every good experiment starts with a clear hypothesis. And the secret to doing everything well, as we know from Agile and Lean, is run experiments. Don't just build, build, build. Run smart experiments. This helps you run smarter experiments. You articulate your product strategy and you prioritize your assumptions. What is it most important to test and why? Linus Pauling loves to, he's a Nobel winning scientist. He says, the best way to have a good idea is lots of ideas. And there's a corporate innovation um, system called StageGate theory that proposes that you run lots of small experiments early on in any project and you, may, you have ideas earn their way through kill gates into actually being funded. Turns out this is the way a lot of game studios work with green lighting projects. And I can't recommend enough to apply this overall idea to your own ideas. To always have multiple ideas. Don't fall in love with any one. It's the best way to find market truth. The second step is to empathize with your super fans to identify the hot core, company, hot core customers you want to pay attention to. And then design what you're doing, whether it's a community system or a product, to really fit with their habits and needs. So this is really something from startups and innovation that I've learned as someone who works a lot with community, is if you can just find a few people that really desperately need something, it's better than hundreds and thousands that kind of like it. Those are the people you want to get in there and pay attention to. And finding these early customers can really make the difference between thriving or failing because who you listen to matters. Every one of you as a community manager know that. People in your community, they're going to tell you they want different things, right? Who you listen to matters. Has anybody heard of innovation diffusion theory? OK, well, you have now. Way back in 1961, Everett Rogers, a scientist at Bell Labs, published this theory based on data gathered over five years in lots of different communities. And the punchline of this graph is that innovation never starts with the majority. It spreads through the innovators and early adopters, and then through them reaches the majority. 30 years later, Jeffrey Moore wrote Crossing the Chasm. How many of you have heard of Crossing the Chasm? He used exactly Everett Rogers' model, same model, same names, but he introduced this idea of the chasm between your early adopters and your early majority. And it turns out that this answers the question of who to listen to and who to ignore. And it's a phase-based thing. When you're at the early stages, when you're doing discovery and you're figuring out what to build, not when you're deep in production building it, when you're really figuring out what to build, High need super fans are the ones who are going to give you the most value and you can identify them by asking yourself who are the people that provide us increasing value over time and we provide them increasing value over time. That can really help you zero in as a tip. So there's a lot more to say there but that's just what it is, what empathizing with your super fans is. Once you've done that, you want to design or tweak the design of what you're building to fit with what you learned about your super fans. You want to create a member journey. Now, this is a big thing in communities because with retention, 
if people don't know what to do next, it's like, okay, I'm here, what do I do next? So in game design, creating a journey is like the heart and soul of it. And I love this quote from Kathy Sierra, who's an OG of game thinking. Make people better at something they want to get better at. If you can do that, you will get retention. So a mastery path, and this is something that you can use right away, apply it to your community, to your product, to your service, has four stages. Discovery is where you learn about it. Onboarding is where you learn the ropes. I think we're all familiar with discovery and onboarding. Habit building is your day 21, day 30, day 60 experience. It's the what pulls you back once you're done with onboarding. And mastery, which is the differentiator between this system and the other engagement systems out there. This whole system frames your customer's experience as a journey to mastery. So thinking about how can those hot core super fans, how can you give them something to master? And what is that thing? And how can you leverage that energy once they've mastered it to create more value for the community is the secret sauce of this whole thing. So how many of you use Slack? Yeah, a lot. So let me, Slack is interesting because it's totally not gamified. There's not a point or a badge in sight, but it's actually got this system, this rhythm to it. So let me show you Slack's mastery path. Discovery is pretty social. People pull you in, you get invites. Very similar to the way you get pulled into a game or Minecraft. Onboarding is really interesting because you interact with a bot, a single player bot, but Slack is a multiplayer experience. And that's a trope right out of gaming. If you have a complex multiplayer environment, onboarding starts with interacting with a single player bot who teaches you the ropes. And once you're good enough, then you go into the multiplayer environment. Anyone ever played a console game with that structure? I have, many of them. Slack has the same structure. Habit building is really about customization. You make it your own. Slack has all these little hooks and it unfolds over time through Slackbot and through new features you discover. And mastery goes even deeper into customization. Launch a channel, program a bot, integrate your app, apply to the Slack slush fund for money. You can keep going down the mastery path. Not a point or a badge in sight. The essence of mastery, as I said before, is creating an experience that gets better as your customer becomes more skilled. That's the kind of design that's going to get people hooked from the ground up. Then you play test that design. You test your assumptions with your super fans. Part of the value of finding a small group of high need super fans is that you can iterate very quickly with them and use them as a proxy for where the rest of your audience is going to be in 18 to 24 months. And it can really speed up your iteration process. With, and time is money. I love this quote. It's so true. And it's what we all want. It's what we want out of Lean Startup is we want to figure stuff out on the drafting table before we've built it because it's a lot easier at that point. This system gives you a way to do that quickly and effectively. So back to uh, Replica, the story of the AI chatbot. So what we did with Replica, and this is something you can do. This is a very specific tip is we had these existing communities. They were a little stalled out, right? They weren't that active because the engagement wasn't high. But we recruited super fans from them. We didn't get all of them in. We filtered and screened people. But we used what was there to recruit our super fans. And then we did rough early mock-ups of our ideas. They looked like this, sketches. They didn't look all pretty. Why do you do that? Because you can iterate faster, and it's cheaper and better. And we tested multiple different ideas. That's how we made our way so quickly to that member journey that turned everything around. So whether you're prototyping new systems in your community or building out your product, your goal with prototyping has to be to learn. If it's not, you're doing it wrong. And as a lifelong designer, I totally fall in love with ideas. And so I've adopted these methods to control myself and not fall in love with ideas, to lift up out of that and fall in love with the act of solving a problem and learning from your customers. When you fall in love with that, that's when you start iterating your way to success. Every hit I worked on had that dynamic in it. We killed our babies. The fifth step is 
coming back around to where you started with your assumptions. Good experiment starts with clear assumptions. Test the assumptions with the right people. And then what do you do? Then you decide what to do next. Often that involves a product roadmap. How many of you deal with making product roadmaps or community roadmaps of any kind? Right. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> so I'm going to show you a particular kind of roadmap that I think is going to inspire you to think about how you're, um, how you're, how you're building out your systems and features. If you want to build engagement from the ground up using this method, this is a cool way to do it. And this, this shows you what every hit I've worked on did. They did it this way. The Sims, Rock Band, Covet, all of them. Starts, we're going to show you matrix. Starts with what you just learned, the path to mastery, four stages. There it is on the x-axis. That's your mastery path. Then on the y-axis, that's the developer path. That's our path, bringing ideas to life. Starts with an MVP. Then you go into beta. Starts with ideas, actually. But MVP is the first thing you build, right? Going to go into beta, maybe alpha before that. Launch. Things don't end there. You have expansion. What's going on here? That's your dev path. And that's your punchline. If you want to build engagement and you're creating something new, don't start by polishing up your onboarding and getting it just right. Don't start by figuring out all your mastery levels and your 72 VIP levels and all those gaming gigas that, frankly, noobs get excited about. Start with the hardest part, which is creating a compelling habit loop that gives people something they, worth coming back for on day 21. That's much harder than good onboarding. And most people don't actually grapple with it. But if you start there, get that working, and then build out from there, adding around it phase-wise, you will be following the path, the well-worn path, to building deep engagement that can last. So I want to close with another story in a very different area to give you a feeling for the breadth of how widely this applies. Any ladies in here ever heard of Shiseido? All right, yeah. And the, if the guys have too, like big props. Shiseido's a, a huge makeup conglomerate. They own a lot of the brands like NARS, Laura Mercier, Buxom. They're based in Japan, very science-based. And there's a question they had. What if we could customize foundation with a smartphone? What would that be like? So they purchased Made to Fit, um, which is a, was a startup here in Silicon Valley with really advanced technology for actually figuring out your skin tone. And you guys, you ladies, skin tone is not simple. There's your tone and then there's your undertone, okay? So it's, it's not simple. But they had figured it out. So they were purchased by this huge company. They partnered with Bare Minerals. They relaunched. There was lots of fanfare. There was millions of downloads. Is the story sounding familiar? But they had really high drop-off and very low retention. And so they were trying to figure out why. We started working together. Figure out why. We started by identifying and interviewing and really get into the mindset of our hot core super fans, who are the people that just loved this makeup, and also people that loved it but had quit using it. Now, we set up and we populated a curated super fan community. So we had about 25, 30 women that had made it through our filtering process. They were all over the United States, Midwest, New York, coast, everything. And we put them all, in this case, in a private Facebook group. And we started keeping that community alive. We had a weekly post. We had a weekly poll. You know the drill. And we used that community weekly to test the updates. We had tested everybody on the concept. And we started making little videos of features we were thinking about. Which homepage do you like, this or this one? Here's a little video of a feature. We just wanted to show you how we're thinking about it. Sketches, right? What do you guys think? And that community became the, the developer's best friend because these people are curated. They're calibrated. We know who they are. We've, they've proven they're going to keep their mouth shut, which is a big deal for a big brand like Shiseido. They're under NDA. We trust them. And we could really pull back the kimono on our iterations, which is very hard to do, and get trusted 
customer feedback from exactly the right people. Well, let me tell you what happened. We were able to improve onboarding and add feedback and stats and get results that the team had been banging their head for a year against a wall and not able to get. Specifically, we changed the way that they did onboarding into meaningful, what I call a chunky progress bar. Meaningful step-by-step -step progress that really helped people understand there's six steps, you have to go through them, let's walk you through it. Simple but incredibly powerful. That changed the drop-off rates there. Big thing we learned, here we go, tone and undertone, is that people didn't trust the scan because we weren't really giving them good enough feedback in a way to understand that they could say, yeah, okay, I'm going to buy this makeup on the internet because I trust your scan. So what we added were these graphs, if you can see them there, for tone and undertone. That took a lot, huge amount of internal work for Shiseido because different makeup brands express this in different ways, it turns out, and everybody likes their way. So it was a huge issue internally, but we pushed through, and then we added this feature, which shows you the feedback. We measured you, and this is what we see. And then we were able on the checkout page to dramatically increase sales by adding those features, which is what they cared about the most. Now, more and more Shiseido brands have been hearing about this success, and they're now setting up and creating their own curated superfan communities. And the head of all Shiseido America has adopted this practice as an alternative to the user panels that they used to put together. They're now doing this company-wide. So let's review. How are you going to decrease churn and drive engagement? Step one, identify the right hot core super fans. Step two, create a super fan, a curated super fan community. Not a big community for everybody, a very specific community for the people that are going to help you bring your ideas to life. And then leverage these people to play test ideas. Leverage these people to really become almost your co-creators. And if you can do that, you are going to be your dev's best friend. You are going to save your company months of time and many tens of thousands of dollars. And you are in the practice of doing that, giving these people a member journey. Because everybody, when, the, when it comes down to it, people want to know they matter. They want to know they're having an impact. They want to know it mattered that they were there. And one of the best ways to show your best customers that is to really listen to them and collect their feedback repeatedly on what you're doing. So we kind of stumbled into that as a member journey for Shiseido, but it's now baked into the way the company practices. It's not the only kind of member journey. But for your best fans, I want you to think about if that could work for you. So I'm going to wrap up quickly. My time is up. Uh, one way to do this is you can do it as a design sprint. Those of you who love Agile and sprints, there's five steps. I'm going to just run through this quickly. You can do that, and if you buy my book, it has everything you need in there to do it. You can do your strategic hypothesis on day one. You can do all the setup you need to do on day two for Empathize. You can sketch out a compelling member journey and a coherent mental model on day three, using what you've, the work you've done so far. On day four, you can set up your three-part high-value play test for whenever you're ready for it. And on day five, you can set up the roadmap that I showed you to figure out where you should start working first. So if, first of all, take these ideas and go experiment. Go run some experiments of your own. If you think, oh my God, I want to do this and I want to work with me to do it and like learn it, do it, get that 10x of um, value and progress for my team, I have a special bonus for you if you go to gamethinking.io slash CMX. Go there and check it out if you're on fire about this. And thank you very much. I hope this inspired you to try something new in your community.